You know, it's totally nice if a camera is attractive, like these two options we have here, but how they function is also important. Okay, I'm changing that color. It's annoying me. Oh, how you like that? Oh, ooh, ooh. oh, I like that one. <laughs> All right, let's start with exposure. And if we're talking exposure, we have to start with aperture. Aperture is the opening of your lens. And on most Fujifilm cameras, the aperture is controlled on the lens itself. And there are little numbers on there to tell you what aperture you're at. I actually like that. You can glance down and see your aperture on the lens. Now with Nikon, they do not have aperture rings on their lenses, which is a little sad. So the aperture has to be controlled with one of the dials. And your aperture is displayed in this little window right here. Uh, the problem with the little window is if it's in low light or it's in the dark, that little window doesn't light up. So you actually have to glance at your screen to see your aperture on the Nikon. On the Fujifilm, you could just look down at the lens. Now, speaking of exposure, the implementation of changing your settings is a little confusing, I think, on the Nikon system. Since there's no aperture wheel on the lens, they decided to have the whole PASM dial here. You actually have to decide your mode first, which decides how the dials work. And I think that's gonna be a little confusing to people. They have to really get over this hump, whether this lives on manual the whole time, and you just, the dials always work. They're always like, you know, av available to you, or you put it on aperture priority, for example, but then you have to remember that your shutter dial won't do anything because in aperture priority, the camera picks your shutter speed. So I just think that the implementation of this PASM dial doesn't make any sense if you have, if you would have had the auto switch on here, maybe, Fujifilm has a patent on that and Nikon couldn't make an auto, but um, it's just a little strange. If you want to shoot full auto on this Fujifilm camera, brah, A, 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 that's it. It's on full auto. And then you're like, hey, I want to control one of these, just the ISO, you can. And it makes more sense than this setup, in my opinion. All right, shutter speed, shutter speed. The, both cameras have a shutter dial, which is great. Fujifilm's, by the way, is a little quieter. Listen to that. <laughs> and their numbers move in opposite directions. So Fujifilm is clockwise to go slower. And on the Nikon, it's actually left, you know, it's counterclockwise to go slower. When you think about it, uh, the one that makes more sense is turning the dial to the right, for me anyway. Turning the dial to the right means going faster, like turning something up, turning something down, or turning it off is usually counterclockwise or left. But I've used a Fujifilm camera for so long that without looking, it's intuitive. And that's kind of the point, that anything that seems weird at first, especially when you pick up a new camera, becomes second nature the more and more you shoot. Now the Fujifilm does have a little lock button on there that prevents the shutter dial from being bumped accidentally. It also has the letter T in case you wanna use one of the dials to change your shutter speed. It has B for bulb, which means you press the shutter, it stays open, the shutter stays open until you press again, then it'll close the shutter. And then there's a little A, which basically means your shutter speed will be automatically picked by the camera. On the Nikon, the lock button does not lock the shutter dial. It actually is just loose all the time. The little button right there only engages when you reach one third stops and that will lock the camera in. And now the dial actually changes all your shutter speeds. So on the Nikon, you have to put it on third to actually get all your shutter speeds. The Fujifilm, the way it works is if you wanna go through a third of a stop, you basically pick your shutter speed and then you can use one of the dials in conjunction to actually dial in thirds, okay? All right, what about ISO or ISO? I'm so hungry. Fujifilm's implementation of the ISO dial is better than the Nikon because you can actually put it on auto ISO from the dial. The way the Nikon works is it has all the ISOs on there, but there is no auto ISO. The only thing you can do is put it on control, okay? And control lets you change the ISO from one of the dials now. But to change to auto ISO, you actually have to dive into the menu and change to auto ISO, which is a little tedious. 
So maybe if you're using the Nikon, you either live full time on auto ISO or you can map it to one of the function buttons. But with a camera that doesn't have that many function buttons, it's really got to be important to you. There are also multiple auto ISOs you can have on Fujifilm, which designate like the maximum ISO you want and maybe the minimum shutter speed you want. So that's also a bonus for the Fujifilm. Changing lenses. Yeah, I know it sounds dumb, but it's different on both of the cameras. So check it out. On the Fujifilm, I've gotten really good at holding the camera at the bottom and having my finger touch, you know, the lens release button. And then just like you're opening up a can of soda, you don't open a can of soda that way. Just like opening up a bottle of soda, of wine, I was gonna say. <laughs> the lens comes off and then you line up the red and then you twist to the right, which is intuitive. On the Nikon, it's a little different. So the lens release is on the side, like most cameras. So here you're holding the camera on the side, but you don't, you twist the other way. So a Nikon is a little bit different. And then to put the lens on is, counterclockwise so it's backwards different thought i'd mention that okay i versus q so fujifilm has the q menu which has a whole screen full of choices nikon has an i menu which for some reason is only the bottom i don't know i wish like we could fill this whole thing up What's great is on Nikon, the touchscreen is very intuitive. You can actually quickly change things. Fujifilm also has touchscreen, but it is not as awesome. It is sometimes hit or miss. If you want to change the things, it's a little laggy. Now, one weird thing with Nikon that you get used to is you have to confirm all your choices. So if you pick something like, for example, your white balance here and you say cloudy and then you just hit menu again or I again, get out of that. It didn't go to cloudy. It stays on sunny. As opposed to with Fujifilm, if you're going to change your white balance, you just turn to, you know, sunny there, get out of the menu and you're on sunny. So the Nikon is very insecure. It wants confirmation. You have to okay everything. Now, main menu wise, uh, both have a customizable my menu, which you can, you know, put your most used items on. Uh, the one thing that's better on the Nikon is Nikon will always remember the last place you were. So let's say you're on that and you turn the camera off and come back a day later. When you turn the camera back on and hit menu, it will remember where you were, where you were working, okay? Which is really beneficial. With the Fujifilm, it kind of stays around there. Like it will stay, like if let's say you're on an item and you go, you exit the menu. Let's say you, oops. Sorry. Let's say you exit the menu and you hit menu again, it will be in the same spot. But as soon as you turn the camera off and go here and hit menu again, it starts at the top again. So the Fuji films like 10 second Tom. Okay, drive mode. Drive mode is if you want to set a timer or if you want to shoot in burst. On Fujifilm cameras, it mostly is under the ISO dial. So you can actually change from a single shot to a low you know, like a low burst or a high burst. Now on the Nikon, you can't change your drive with any physical dial. You actually have to set it to a custom function or put it on your little eye menu. All right, changing your focus modes. There's two things you change with focus. The first one is single focus, nothing is moving. Continuous focus, something is moving. Or you really want to go retro on this camera and put a manual focus lens on there. Manual focus. And then the other formula is the area, the focus area. And these cameras are getting better with like, you know, recognizing a raccoon or some kind of airplane or something. The Fujifilm is definitely more hands-on and more retro. You actually have this little dial on the front, which gives you single, continuous, and manual. And then for area, you actually have a joystick, which you can push and make a single focus point make it a zone, which is a zone is good if something's moving at you. And then you can be the full area, which is called wide, in case you wanna focus on the entire scene somehow. With the Nikon, it's a little complicated. It seems like Nikon sort of is still in that transition between DSLR modes and mirrorless. They actually brought over one of the focus modes called dynamic mode from the DSLR, which I don't really feel like they needed to, but Let's show you how it works. 
So there is no focus switch. So it has to be done with a, you know, sort of front dial, back dial. So for me, I actually set this, uh, you know, movie record button, hold it down, and I use the front dial to go from single to, you can see it there, single to manual focus to continuous focus. We have a directional pad to change our focus area. Uh, so no joystick on here. Now, by the way, you can set the screen on this camera to be a little joystick. You know, you can actually look through the viewfinder and drag your finger and that will move the focus point around if those of you that like a little joystick button. But the modes are, you know, you have what's called 3D mode and 3D mode is actually pretty cool. It is a center focus point that you can lock on something and then hold it and you can move the camera around, which is really convenient. And you have a lot of customizable uh, boxes. You can actually change the shape of them. You can make them long and skinny. And I actually find this really helpful when shooting events and I have to shoot through things. I actually use this tall rectangular one. So I like that you can do that. Uh, but I've actually disabled a lot of the dynamic because you know I don't really, use, there's just too many modes. All right, the screen, both cameras have a touch screen. They also can focus and shoot. You can turn the touch screen off if you bump it, which I do on both of these cameras all the time. My focus point is always to the corner somewhere, and it's usually because my hand brushes along the edge or something. Their screens are a little different though. The most Fujifilm cameras have a tilty screen and then like a vertical dude like this, so you can shoot vertical pictures where for this retro camera, Nikon has made a fully articulating screen. The best thing about this is just to pretend you have a film camera, closing it and actually using the camera viewfinder only. For filming yourself, it's great, but most photographers prefer this flip up screen, okay? Now, if you have the Fujifilm X-T4, that has a fully articulating screen, so if you like that screen, there is a couple of Fujifilm cameras that have that. Okay, boy, there's like too many settings. What's next? Ooh, back button focus. That's like my favorite topic ever, <laughs> especially fighting the people who focus using the shutter button. Back button focus is available on both these cameras. And at first I wasn't gonna talk about this, but you know, I found out that Leica Q cameras don't really have a back button focus option. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's like there seems to be a hack where you can do it, but it's not really something you can set up on a... Once I saw that, I was like, I don't need a Leica. That's the only reason I wouldn't get a Leica. Now with the Fujifilm, I used to use back button focus, one of these tiny little junky buttons, definitely better on the Nikon. The, the back button focus button is a little bit more robust. However, one of you taught me a cool life hack for Fujifilm that the rear button pushes in and actually that has become my back button focus and this has become my zoom. So I actually flipped those two. The Nikon does not have pushing dials, by the way, and they only have one custom button there. Would have been nice to have a second custom button, but you know, I wanna make it look retro, I guess. So back button focus, works on both cameras, but Fujifilm has a little trick up its sleeve, a little trick, because you can actually have the shutter be your autofocus when you have the camera set to single or continuous, but you flip it to manual. Once you flip it to manual focus, this obviously won't work anymore, but what's cool, the life hack here, is your back button focus is always active, no matter what mode you're in in the front. Switching photo to video on this older X-T3, sorry, I don't have the latest cameras. The switch to movie mode is underneath the ISO dial. You could just put it on movie mode there. On the newer ones, there's a full movie switch. And what's great is um, starting with the X-T3, the camera settings for video and for photo are completely separate. So you can have all your photo settings and then switch to video and be set there with shutter speed your film simulation can be different. The same thing with the Nikon. So the Nikon has a switch. They can switch to video there. You do have to dive into the menu to decouple the, the, the settings uh, being the same, okay? Uh, the, because if you don't, by default, you have the same you know, picture style, you have the same uh, 
settings on both, okay? Especially auto ISO and all that. Now, one negative for video, if you're a hybrid shooter, is shutter speed and all that is controlled. It will be the same on both. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been playing around with the camera for a couple of days. If I flick it to video, I have to change my shutter speed to the film shutter speed. Let me know in the comments if I'm wrong about that because that makes it not a great hybrid camera. You want a camera if you're a video and a photo shooter to keep those shutter speeds completely separate. And I'm pretty sure this camera can't do that. So, uh, eh. And overall, I'll just end with customizability. Uh, Nikon has decided to go a little bit more simple, a little bit more retro. They have less customizable buttons than the Fujifilm. Fujifilm being a smaller camera has a lot of little buttons and dials that you can, you know, customize, especially my favorite. I'm like a broken record on this channel. The D-pad. Uh, look at that. I show you right now how great this is. So up for me is my white balance. You can change your white balances easily. To the right, I have all my film, you know, custom settings for film simulations. To the left is actual film simulations. And then since the play button is on the left here, I actually made my down be play. Okay, let's change our background again. You can tell I have this uh, new remote that's a, uh, oh, yes, check that out. <laughs> so in conclusion, they're both amazing, wonderful cameras. Uh, as far as controls and implementations of things, you will get used to both. However, in my opinion, the winner for the real retro feel is to me, the Fujifilm makes more sense because of the way the dials are set up. The PASM implementation of the PASM, which disables some of your dials, I think can become a little frustrating. Also, the fact that auto ISO isn't on the camera. And the third one being that third stops have to be put in a third stop mode, as opposed to Fujifilm, which is like you can pick a shutter and then go to third stops if you wanna. Anyway, they're both great cameras, but let me know what you think in the comments. And uh, yeah, oh, excuse me, I had a little, ah. <laughs>